I've made over 300 mind maps. Here's one of my first mind maps, which is about half a page worth of normal linear notes. And here's a more recent one that I made for my masters, which is equivalent to almost a hundred pages of notes. In this video, I'm gonna give you four secrets of effective mind mapping that took me over a decade to figure out. And make sure to stick around to the end of the video because I'll explain how you can integrate the famous Feynman technique into your mind mapping to make it the most powerful learning tool you have in your arsenal. So secret number one, turn your mind maps into a mind mirror. Let me explain. When I first started mind mapping, I used to just treat it like normal note taking. I read some stuff, I listen to some stuff, and then I just try to put it down onto my map. I'm simplifying a few words, I'm paraphrasing, I'm shortening and abbreviating, I'm adding some lines and arrows in places where I think things are connected. And I thought that was pretty much it to mind mapping. Pretty easy, pretty useless. I honestly didn't find it very effective, so I actually kind of stopped mind mapping for a few years. And then when I entered into medical school, one of my friends in a lecture, I noticed that they were mapping during a lecture. And they said that they were finding it really effective and really useful. And at this point, I was like falling asleep in pretty much every lecture anyway. So I was willing to give anything a go. And this is also the point at which I was like really, really heavily into just doing like lots and lots of flashcards. And I was really seeing to start how overwhelming it can be. And I was like trapped in this never ending flashcard cycle. So in the next lecture, I decided to just try mapping it out instead. So no more lecture slides that I'm annotating on, no more uh, Evernote or OneNote or just like typing things out as I went. It was kind of weird because I felt almost like naked. It was just me, my brain, the lecturer, and a blank piece of paper. It felt like all my, my gear, all my tools were like stripped away from me. And in hindsight, I think this really helped me because I'd be sitting there in the lecture and I'd be trying to create this mind map. But because the lecturer didn't really make it a priority to make the lecture more easily understandable, I just didn't have time to write down absolutely everything like I was kind of more used to. So I started cutting down the words that I was using to just the key words and I spent more time thinking about what is actually worth writing down and what is important enough that I want to write it down in the way that is the most efficient way possible. And that's when I realized, first of all, how powerful a simple arrow can be at representing actually quite a complex relationship. And also how with my previous notes, a lot of the words I was writing weren't really helping my learning of it anyway. In fact, with less words, it was getting easier because there were less things on the page for my brain to try to process through. It meant that I could spend more time actually thinking about the ideas and how they connect together and less time just trying to read everything on the page. And so even though it was actually a lot harder initially, it got much, much easier doing it this way than with my old technique. And I would leave the lecture feeling like, okay, I actually understood most of the things they were explaining. And for the first time I had, you know, like more questions. I was able to think about it a lot more deeply. Uh, when I went to study, I kind of had an understanding about which parts I needed to revise more versus which parts, you know, were relatively strong. I had more of a clear direction. Whereas before I would leave the lecture just being like, well, I'm going to have to study all of that all over again. Like pretty much all I did is attend the lecture and I would be, you know, like, even more overwhelmed after the lecture than beforehand. And also just like really tired, despite the fact that I spent half the lecture sleeping. So what does this all have to do with this concept of like a mind mirror? Well, one of the things that I started realizing very early on was that because I was thinking so much about how to write it down in a way that actually makes sense, the notes that I was producing reflected my mind much more closely. And so I could start visually seeing where there were gaps in my knowledge and where I struggled with. If there was a problem on the map, there was a corresponding problem in my mind, in my own memory. If it looked really messy and chaotic, then that meant that it was also pretty messy in my brain too. For example, if you have a look at this map that I did relatively early on, you can see that there are these parts here which look really, really messy. And yes, all these ideas are connected to each other, but if someone actually asked me to explain it and navigate those connections in a coherent way, I'd get overwhelmed and I wouldn't know where to start. Whereas on the other hand, if you have a look at this part of the same map where it just happened to look more clean and more organized, and I remember I thought about it a little bit more to try to get it clean and organized, 
then I was able to talk about this part and answer problems related to these things much more easily. And it didn't matter what someone asked me about this, I had a confidence with the topic that I could hit it from any angle and navigate it in any direction. And as I slowly started to make my mind maps more clean and more organized and look at the messy things and then use that as an opportunity to clean that part up, I started entering into exams where you'd have these curveball questions that used to make me think, holy crap, I've never seen this before. I've never thought about it this way before. They never taught me this. I started thinking of it like, hmm, that's an interesting angle to explore. I can make that work. And I'd never been able to think about these types of questions with that mentality before. But it really took years to embrace that part where I was willing to put down something on my mind map that wasn't that organized, that wasn't that good. I had this feeling that when I write it on my map, it should be as perfect as possible. So if you have a look at this mind map that I did really, really early on, you can see that it looks really clean, but it's clean because I just didn't put all the information on it because I knew that as soon as I tried to add more stuff, it was gonna get messy. So it's not that it was more organized in my brain, it's like I literally just avoided the part that made it more confusing, which like I needed all of that knowledge anyway. So the secret is don't do that. If it's messy, put it down, use your map like a mirror. Put down what you're thinking, add all the connections, add all the arrows, let it be messy. And then when it's on paper, you can look at it, you can see the mistakes and the gaps for what it is. And then you can start to progressively try to clean it up and reorganize it. And when you don't avoid that, when you look for the parts that are messy and you recognize that that means that that structure is not quite clear in your head, it creates a really high yield focused area for your revision. Any area of a map that looks disorganized, messy, arrows or lines flying around everywhere, or literally just like a whole gap like this, just literally nothing there, even though you know there should be something there, maybe you just like missed that part of the topic, these are areas that you should work on. And being able to visually see it makes things so much more easy than trying to find your gaps through just like going over the same thing again and again, hoping to find something that you missed or like just testing yourself with like 10,000 practice questions. Which directly relates to secret number two. Never get it right on your first try. You know how I said that if it's messy, just put it down on paper and then try to organize it afterwards? Well, I really mean it. You see, because of my type A typical like med student personality, and I had this perfectionism, and I wanted to create the best mind map first try. And you might've had this experience yourself, but this is really, really hard. In fact, I actually wonder if it's humanly possible. For most topics, I realized that there are usually so many concepts and keywords and potential relationships that you can overload your brain within like minutes of thinking about it. I can't even imagine trying to think about every single connection and pattern and every concept and create this like perfect knowledge schema of an entire topic first try without making any mistakes. I actually don't think the human brain is capable of that level of processing. What is infinitely more efficient and way easier is to just put your ideas down as hypotheses and just work and build on them as you go. Put down some words, draw a few lines, think maybe I could organize it like this, I well, wonder if that makes sense, or maybe I could do it like this, wonder if that makes sense, I don't know, let me come back to it later, read a little bit more, add a few more words, add a few more lines, think does it make sense, I don't know, <laughs> come back to it later. Like, if you use your mapping as a cognitive offload so that it stops things from getting overwhelming and you can literally look at the ideas that you were thinking of and then refine them. And when you think about it as everything you write down in the first go, it's all gonna be wrong. Like nothing in there is gonna be perfect. You're using it like a whiteboard, like a scratch pad so that on the fifth or sixth or seventh iteration of organization and thinking about it, you can get it to a point where it's like accurate and really, really good and flows and it's like super organized. 
then that will be a win. You're gonna notice that you are way more engaged while you're reading or listening. You're gonna find that you're aware of knowledge gaps much earlier on. You'll find that your memory is much deeper. You'll find that your depth of understanding is more nuanced. And for the same amount of time spent studying, you will end up with a much more robust set of knowledge. In the early days, I used to try to get it right the first time and I used to think like, maybe just by continuing to push to get it right the first time, it's gonna train my brain's ability to like process and think about it and then one day if I keep pushing at it, I will get to a point where like my first mind map, first go is just like immaculate. So my first attempt is a lot better than I would have been able to do 10 years ago. It is still impossible to get it right the first time. And trying to do that always leads to something that is lower quality and just more time consuming. It is a complete lose-lose situation. And I want you to compare that with something that is completely win-win. For example, liking this video. When you like this video, I win because this video reaches more people and you win because it means that I keep making videos for free every week. You could even turn it into a triple win by subscribing. Anyway, speaking of winning moves, uh, we've got secret number three, which is never, ever, ever start organizing your ideas the same way it is presented to you. Now this is kind of a tricky one, so listen carefully. There's this cognitive bias called framing bias. Framing bias is basically your brain's tendency to judge later information based on how it was presented or framed to you. This is talked about a lot in fields like medicine where you know you could have a junior doctor say, hey, uh, boss, can you have a look at this patient? They've got gastritis, you know, a bit of heartburn. Uh, they're coming in with, you know, pain, you know, like right here, like above their stomach, and they get this kind of like acid sensation in the back of their throat. It's like a burning feeling coming up. It's worse after they eat. Then that way of presenting the patient makes someone think, okay, yeah, they've said, hey, boss, I've got someone with heartburn. And then they describe these things that sound like heartburn. But it might not be, it might be a heart attack. It might be like an atypical presentation of a heart attack. But you don't wanna bias yourself into thinking, yep, it's heartburn and therefore miss the heart attack. And this is the same thing when it comes to studying. A lot of the time when you're taught something in lecture slides or in like a textbook, there are headings and subheadings and there's a certain organizational hierarchy that someone thought this is a logical way of teaching it to someone else. And every now and again, you get lectures where you wonder like, did they ever even think about what would be a logical way of teaching this to us? But regardless, you can't avoid the fact that when you're learning something, you are consuming that information in someone else's frame. And that's gonna bias the way you think about it. Now the problem is that the way that it makes sense for you and the way that you should organize it that makes the most sense for your brain is not always the same. That's why you could have an expert teacher explain something to you, but then when your friend explains it to you, it actually clicks and makes sense a lot more easily. It's more intuitive. Or you could read two books about the same topic, but one book just explains it in a way that just feels so much more intuitive for you. But maybe for another person, they prefer the other book. And it's not about how they're gonna test or examine or how you need to use your knowledge either. And that's a common thought. You can learn something in a frame, in an organizational structure that's not the same as how they're gonna test you. But if that's the way that makes more sense for your brain, it's gonna be easier for your brain to encode that information, keep it in your memory, and reinforce the pathways. And once that knowledge is there, you can then use that knowledge in whatever direction and angle that you want. You can make the knowledge fit how you need to apply it it's much less effective to try to force your brain to understand it in the way you need to apply it or how you're gonna be tested if that's not a way that makes sense for your brain. You're now gonna be fighting against how your brain wants to learn it for the sake of meeting some marking criteria when it would actually be much faster to learn it the way your brain wants to that makes the most sense for your brain and then just manipulate that information more freely once you have legitimately better expertise. And in some cases, you can find an angle that hits both. It is both better for the way you need to use your knowledge and it makes more sense for your brain. A great example of this is one time when I was working in the emergency department uh, as a student, 
And I remember my senior pulled me aside and he was like, okay, tell me everything that you know about shock. Now shock in medical speak is basically when your body is like shutting down, it's like a crisis mode. And so I said, okay, well, you know, like a medical student, I was like, okay, well, there's uh, five different types of shock and, you know, here are all the different, you know, types. And then there are these different examples for every single different type. And then these are the different symptoms and the, you know, mechanisms for each of those subtypes and examples. And then he was like, okay, okay, that's enough. Like that's too slow. You don't have five, 10 minutes for every patient you see for you to like work through this checklist. And then he pulls out a little piece of paper and he draws on it in like 45 seconds, a very simple diagram of the human body. And he was like, think of the body like a pump, tubes and organs. And he showed me how all of the different examples that I was talking about before really cleanly can just be fit into this new framework of thinking about shock. And after about a minute, I started thinking, this way of thinking about shock is so much easier than the way that I've been trying to learn it before, which is how it was taught to me in my lectures and in my textbooks. And it's not like it was some ridiculously like technical, you know, advanced way of thinking about it. I could totally have just myself thought of a different way to repackage that material in a way that made more sense for me. And I probably would have arrived at that same framework I just never bothered to. I didn't realize it would help me. And when I started thinking about it in this way, my retention was better. I was able to use that information more freely. Like I, I could recall it much more quickly. It just felt much more intuitive. It was better in every way. And I didn't have to just memorize everything like I was doing before. It was the same amount of information just filed away in a different way. And so here's the learning point. If we start by assuming that the way something is presented to us is the right way to learn it, then that's gonna affect the way that we can organize the information and it's gonna stop us from seeing potentially other frameworks. A lot of the time people will say, well, this method that they have taught me is really, really logical. It makes sense already. How could there be any other way of learning it? All I have to do is just take this and then memorize it. But here's the thing. If you need to memorize it in order for you to remember it, it probably means it's not that intuitive. It might be logical, but there could be another way of thinking about it that is just as logical, but more intuitive. And you're never going to know until you deliberately look for it. And I found that for most topics, there is usually more often than not a way of repackaging the information to make it more optimal for your brain and for your memory. So just from my personal experience or experience working with students, here's a few examples of ways that things have traditionally been packaged and then how students have been able to repackage it in ways that made more sense for them. So for something like history or historical events, often things have been presented to them in a way that's like before, during and after. But an alternative grouping might be something like drivers, mechanisms and consequences, which is again also very logical, but potentially more intuitive depending on the topic. For subject like medicine or dentistry, often things are presented like history, examination, investigation and management. Now the problem with this is that like every disease is presented in this way. And so what becomes problematic is that because every single thing is like categorized in the exact same way, that categorization doesn't actually help you to remember the information. Like the, the categories become meaningless because everything is categorized that way. But in some cases for some diseases, it might actually make more sense to divide it into something that's more like mechanisms or pathophysiology and then severity. And then the management comes off as an example of how you treat anything that has that kind of mechanism and that level of severity. And again, these are just a couple of examples. There's literally hundreds of different ways that you can package information. And I think it is a pretty characteristic sign of a high level learner to be able to find a way of organizing information in a way that feels more intuitive for them. And I'm not saying that you can't ever organize it in the same way that it was taught to you. But I'm saying that if you do end up organizing it in the same way, that should be an independent conclusion that you arrive at after you have really thought about it and have thought about alternatives. As a quick test, if you look at how you've organized and grouped your information and you think, I don't even know any other way to arrange this, 
it probably means that you can think about it a little bit more. After all, you can't decide that something is the best way if you don't even know of any other ways. And trust me, there's always some other way. Now next up is our final secret, but first a word from our sponsor. Yes, that is, again, me. Most of the stuff that I talk about in all of my videos has been in my guided program for years. It is a distillation of over a decade of my experience helping learners become ultra efficient in a step-by-step -step guided program where you only need to spend like 20-30 minutes every two or three days to take in some new theory and techniques you then practice them throughout the week and you can get feedback within our community and our team of coaches. Making the program the best it can be is where the majority of my time and focus goes. If you're interested, you can check it out at iCanStyle.com. I'll put a link in the description. And so finally, secret number four, which is to integrate the Feynman technique. Now the Feynman technique basically says that if you want to learn something, you should try to explain it to a 10 year old. And there's a little bit more to it than that, but this mindset complements mind mapping perfectly. And the reason is because especially when we learn a new topic, there's often a lot of new terminology and terminology is like vanilla essence. Let me explain. If you've ever opened up a bottle of vanilla essence before, you know that that stuff is potent. You know, you literally put like a, like a tiny little teaspoon of vanilla essence to like vanilla flavor an entire cake. The humble vanilla bean has been ruthlessly concentrated and extracted so that for just like a few drops of this vanilla essence, you are getting like a concentrated bomb of flavor. And that is exactly what terminology is. When we learn a new piece of terminology, it's not just a word or a couple of words. It is an entire network of ideas and relationships that were so complicated that someone decided we need a whole word just for it. And so when we introduce new terminology into our mind maps or our notes, it can overload our brain very easily. And so one way that we can supercharge our mind maps is to deliberately use non-technical words that a 10 year old could understand. So for example, let's say you're studying cell division and there's a phase in there, it's called anaphase. Instead of writing anaphase, you could just write away, which is basically what happens in that phase. And you can still have your terminology under it so you don't forget it, you just have it in brackets underneath. But by taking a moment to turn that terminology into a simpler word, not only do we deepen our understanding of that word by turning it into something that we feel we're able to understand more intuitively, which is like making a mini analogy, we're also able to speed up our review of that information because our brain can spend more time thinking about the ideas and less time reading each piece of terminology and spending 10, 15 seconds trying to unpack exactly what that word meant. Now, the reason this is secret number four is that if you actually just try to do this, you'll realize that it's kind of impossible to do it properly without doing secrets number one, two, and three first. Now, I've told people to do mind maps with these methods for years. And if you've tried mind mapping before and it wasn't really that good, then try it again with these tips and I guarantee you, you're gonna have a completely different experience. It will feel more challenging, but that is your brain trying to figure things out. That is your brain being active in the learning process and that's gonna result in you having a better memory and a better depth of understanding. Challenging is good. So give these tips a go. I'm sure they're gonna help. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.